actually want to take a look at this. I wrote out that kind of... Uh, my name is Van Goss. Um, I, I welcome you on behalf of our distinguished panel and my co-chair, Margaret Power, and our entire organization before we move into the panel itself. And I will turn over to Margaret. ...happened today. And um, I'm going to say a few words, and I'm going to... Can you guys hear it? Okay. Can you... Not too close. Can you hear in the... John and Jerry, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, then... Um, I'm going to say a few words about what Ha has done. We will be brief. Do not worry. Then we're going to have each of our really great panelists speak for about 10 minutes, and on that we will be fairly strict. No, very strict. And then we'll open it up for discussion, questions, answers, commentary. So a lot of the discussion today, a lot of the time today, will be spent on us talking to each other. And the one thing we do ask is when you speak, if you speak, could you identify yourself? Okay, now back to Ha, uh, back to Van. Not sure why we're going back and forth, but that's Exercise. how it worked out. So it's actually really, really appropriate that we're here at the AHA in the first weekend of January in 2008, because five years ago we were founded at the AHA in Chicago in January 2003. And there's a point to that, which is how long this miserable, uh, historically, we all, we've all been there. In fact, I saw Marv Gettleman wearing a button saying, it's stupid, right? This thing that literally made no sense to, and still makes no sense, right? right. That, wasn't an, that was not an informed analysis. It's been five <laughs> long years, right? And we're still waiting and we're still here. Six? Yeah, oh my so God. We're now 2009. I can't even count. Uh, yeah. Ugh, yeah. It's, hard, it's so hard to get used to. March, this war yeah. just goes on and on. <laughs> Thank you. But it's worth noting that our, when we met in, uh, six years ago, that we wrote this short founding statement that evening, and I just want to point out that David Montgomery played the central role in writing that statement, which allowed us to go and recruit several thousand people on extremely short notice, historians and historically minded activists into Haw, and made us into the only academically oriented, the only thing in our sector, if you'll pardon the word, that has worked against the war. And we are somewhat proud of what we've done. We could have done more, but we've done some, some things that mean something. And Margaret will talk about that. <laughs> okay, really, then we'll get to the panelists. I just want to say very briefly that some of the things that we have, ha have been able to accomplish is we've had two national conferences, one in Austin, Texas, one in Atlanta, Georgia. They were both very successful. Um, a lot due to HA, and I want to make a special mo mention here of Alan Dolly, who is no longer with us, that he was instrumental in writing and then helping us pass the uh, um, AHA resolution against the war. And I know many of us know him personally, and I think all of us who know him or don't know him personally, all of us miss him very much. And I'm very, so I'm very sorry he's not here with us. And in addition to that, HA has sponsored teachings on different campuses. And I think one of the things that HA does do is we serve to organize ourselves and organize other historians to actually be active on campus. And I think all of us are constantly feeling that, why aren't there more of us? Why aren't there more of us being active? And that's the one side. And the other side is, well, at least there are, uh, there, we are here and we are being active. So we want us to keep being active. We're all glad Obama won. We are so relieved. But I think we also know that the only way, well, this, I think this is a group sentiment. The only way that things will actually progress is if there is mass public pressure, social movements, and keeping the pressure on. And that's part of what we can do as historians and as people in this country. I think that's everything I need to say. Is that right? Wait a minute. I forgot one thing. Excuse me. After this panel discussion, Historians Against the War is having a meeting to which you are all invited, and we're actually going to be having a discussion. It's called One Faltering Economy and Two Wars, What Can Historians Contribute? And we're sort of talking about how, um, to, in terms of historians, anti-war historians, and how do we, what do we do given the, the current economic crisis? And we also want to talk about broadening the mission of HA given what's currently going on, for example, in Gaza. And so that we've basically been focused on Iraq with some other um, resolutions about when the, when the Israelis attacked Lebanon. But we want to actually talk about, let's look at the new situation and what we can do about it. Our first speaker today is Alice Kessler Harris. She is the R. Gordon Hoxie Professor of American History at Columbia University and professor in the Institute for Research on Women and Gender. 
Kessler-Harris specializes in the history of American labor and the comparative and interdisciplinary exploration of women and gender. Her books include In Pursuit of Equity, Women, Men, and the Quest for Economic Citizenship in 20th Century America, Out to Work, A History of, of Wage-Earning Women in the United States, A Women's Wage, Historical Meanings and Social Consequences, and Women Have Always Worked, A Historical Overview. She is co-editor of Protecting Women, Labor Legislation in Europe, Australia, and the United States, and U.S. History as Women's History. Her most recent book, Gendering Labor History, contains her essay on women's work and social policy. Welcome, Alice. Thank you. I want, want you to know this is a historic occasion. It's the first time that K, for Kessler Harris, has ever been the first in the alphabet. <laughs> I mean, usually I'm somewhere in the indistinguishable middle, so I'm happy to be number one for a change. I'm also very happy to be here today, and I take my 10-minute role. We've each been given 10 minutes for a presentation. Uh, as a I mean, I, I wouldn't want to call it representative, but as I look around the room and as I look at my fellow panel members, I think each of us could spend 10 hours, not 10 minutes, talking about the legacy of the Bush-Cheney administration and that that legacy of the administration is something that all of us as historians and as professionals and as citizens have been thinking about uh, at least since uh, uh, Barack Obama was elected president. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is not try to cover everything, which I think would be impossible, but to offer you uh, a couple of suggestions, ways of provoking and thinking about the legacy of the Bush-Cheney administration in the hope that we will all talk together after the presentations are over. So where to begin with this? Uh, what I want to do is begin by uh, saying that as I sit back and think about the, the legacy in relationship to my own sense of self as a historian and what I particularly can say about it, I think that much of my work as a historian has had to do with the role of ideology, of ideas in shaping people's movements and people's actions, people's relationship to their lives and their politics. And I, can th I think we can think about the Bush-Cheney administration the last eight years in the same kinds of ideological terms and that perhaps doing so might help us frame the kinds of things that have come out of the administration. So I, I think what I want to do is to present to you three arenas in which ideology has functioned uh, has left a legacy for us, most of it negative, although I do have to say that out of it, in dialectical fashion, I believe, will grow some of the seeds of what might well be a positive uh, response in the years to come. Uh, first ideological legacy, uh, the idea and the practice of terror. Uh, I, I open up the subject of terror because I think the construction of terrorism in the last eight years, and particularly since 9-11, uh, has been a new and elusive concept, uh, a concept that has been wielded, deployed, used, manipulated, and ingrained in our consciousnesses in exactly the same way that the concept of communism, not the state uh, as it functioned as a communist state, but the idea of communism as an enemy was ingrained in our um, uh, consciousnesses. Uh, indeed, I'd say that given the end of the Cold War, terrorism may, have, may now be the new communism, if you like. 
That idea of terrorism, whatever it means, has made possible a range of behaviors, including the doctrine of a preemptive war, which uh, I think will have long-standing uh, legacy, uh, the resort to the military to solve problems before resorting to diplomatic strategy, uh, America's pursuit of its unilateral interests through military power, and I could go on. But I want to make one special point in this respect, um, which was actually made for me by my friend Sarah Shields this morning, who said that uh, what it has enabled us to do is to negate the human costs of war. That because in the interests of, of fighting terror, we feel as though we are fighting for our own self-interest, we therefore deny and decry, as we did, for example, in the war in Vietnam, the human costs of the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, the numbers of refugees, the women and children without <coughs> means of support, and certainly without means of male support, and so on. Uh, I'm still on the idea of Terror, which I think also produces the idea of unending war, um, uh, a war which has neither beginning nor end. It has no uh, uh, locatable geographical source, uh, and uh, it can therefore be utilized as an idea that moves people to act in the name of patriotism in a variety of ways. In the name of war, the war on terror, we have uh, uh, created uh, this abomination that we call homeland security. Uh, another idea uh, which has implications in practice, but an idea whose consequences are nothing short of horrifying. An idea in whose name we, we the United States, uh, has wiretapped, has uh, uh, violated the liberties of civilians, of American citizen civilians, uh, as well as of um, uh, non-American citizens, uh, has turned over what should be civilian uh, prosecutions to the military, uh, has violated wholesale uh, acts of um, secrecy or has extended acts of secrecy to places where they never belong, has created the category of secrets to defend the United States against being called to account for these activities, has challenged access to the court, to the courts for uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people. Uh, all that in the name of the idea of homeland security, which is meant to fight the idea of terrorism, whatever that is. And finally, the idea of terrorism has produced an absence of accountability. I don't know what better way to say that, but that is to, uh, it has uh, produced a situation where there is nobody to hold responsible. Uh, that when we turn to uh, uh, Cheney, when we turn to Bush and say, you know, ought we not to impeach these people for criminal activities, the answer is they are protecting us, right? They are defending us against terrorism. Don't we all want to be protected against it? So that idea, the first idea, second idea, uh, now, this one is a little more complicated, and here I want to talk about the ideology of free markets and what that has meant in the last eight years. Now, I, I only have two more minutes. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have to negotiate, but okay. <laughs> um, 
uh, the ideology of free markets. Now, we all know that the ideology of free markets didn't, didn't, was not initiated in this administration. Indeed, it's probably a function of the last 20 or 25 years or so, since probably since Ronald Reagan. But that the ideology of market fundamentalism has been put into practice so brutally in the last eight years. Uh, that um, you know the the Bush notion that uh, markets are best left on their own without regulation entirely, as opposed to even the minimal kinds of regulation that a Bill Clinton uh, would have imposed, is an idea which has had severe consequences for this. Now, the most recent consequence, of course, is the current financial catastrophe, but that financial catastrophe has been prefigured by the rising debt and deficit uh, of the last eight years, and that really was a function of eight years, by the shift in the language of class, which all of us noticed in the last election, so that nobody anymore talks about working class people. The idea that people are workers is off the table, we, we are now all middle class, whatever that means in terms of ideas and ideals and aspirations. And finally, in terms of home ownership, again, one of the vehicles that um, uh, Bush, the Bush administration, the Bush-Cheney administration used and fostered to denote the uh, notion that everybody could move into the middle class, a notion which, of course, was belied by the um, uh, um, downward spiral in real wages that occurred in exactly the same period that the idea of home ownership was fostered. This ideology of the free market has taken deep roots in American society so that even now with an Obama administration uh, faced with the prospect of regulating that market, one still hears echoes of the fact, you know, it's okay to bail out the banks, but is it okay to bail out the automobile industry, for example? Is big government still always bad? or can big government be imagined sometimes to be good? That is, can we turn to government for good things? And finally, my third point in terms of uh, ideology is the shift that I see in the ideology of, um, you might call it the ideology of individualism, uh, the, the sort of increasing and creeping notion over the last 20 years, which reached its apogee in the past eight years, uh, that uh, the values of democracy, what we used to call democracy, and which we used to think resided in at least some level of collective activity, of social consciousness and care for each other, resides in fact in maximum liberty. So a shift in that notion that individualism could be protected by a kind of hands-off laissez-faire attitude as opposed to the New Deal stance and the post-New Deal co coalitions which agreed that individualism and democracy could be best preserved through such programs as social security, um, uh, strong unemployment uh, insurance, and even the extension of social services, including perhaps health care. Now, we see in this ideological move a genuine debate. One of the most disappointing things about the Obama campaign to many of us was that Obama could not come out for a health care system, which we sometimes call a single payer system but for a healthcare system which acknowledged the value of social care for each other, some kind of national insurance system. Instead, he acknowledged the role of the insurance companies and the way in which we have to accommodate those individualistic values. I believe that those values, that shifting sense of what we mean by individualism and individual values, 
will last uh, a long time. That the I idea that um, everyone has to decide for himself or herself what is good and what is right is an idea that will prevail. And I believe that that idea will have serious consequences, <laughs> among other things, for women, for the issue of reproductive rights, for the growing sense of inequality in this society, and for the great difficulty we have in fighting the real inequalities that have resulted as a consequence of the last 10 years. So if I had more time, I would tell you what the good seeds of change are that could come out of these. But instead, I'm going to let all my fellow <laughs> panelists depress you even more. <laughs> Thank you. Our next panelist is David Montgomery. He is Farnham Professor of History Emeritus at Yale University and past president of the Organization of American Historians. He worked for 10 years as a machinist in New York and the Twin Cities and was an active member of IAM, UE, and the Teamsters during those years. He is the author of many books, including The Fall of the House of Labor, The Workplace, the State, and American Labor Activism, 1865 to 1825. Citizen Worker, the experience of workers in the U.S. with democracy and the free market during the 19th century. Workers' Control in America, studies in the history of work, technology, and labor struggles, and beyond equality, labor and the radical Republicans, 1862 to 1872. His latest book um, is Black Worker Struggle for Equality in Birmingham, written in conjunction with Professor Horace Huntley of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. David? Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you, Alice, for covering so much of what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> So this spares all of you, I think, a little bit of Montgomeryism uh, in this particular session. But I do want to repeat a basic point. There's no question but that the Obama election opened up enormous hopes among the people of this country. Hopes for exactly what is often hard to say. <laughs> and that's what we've got to have a hand in defining over the course of the years to come. But hopes, yes, hopes evident in the appearance of the first sit-down strike in a long time. No sooner is he elected than wham, workers in Chicago occupy the factory and the police do not throw them out. Obama says they were right and they win. Uh, the demands that were there. The only thing wrong with that whole struggle was the press report, which said there have been no sit-down strikes in America since the 1930s. I was in one in Brooklyn, New York in 1953, uh, American safety Racing. Same union, though, so that's maybe what pulls them all together uh, in this struggle. But the fact of the matter is hmm, that these hopes have opened up the victory of the workers of Smithfield Ham in winning after 15 years of struggle, first of all fought by the Latino workers, devastated by immigration service raids. Then the hopes were taken over by African-American workers until the NLRB actually issued a few good rulings, reinstating a couple of the Latinos. And suddenly there was a united front of the two groups that made for this new hope and a new atmosphere that was there. This sense then, that something can be done by popular action. Even in my new neighboring city of Philadelphia, something that seems far removed from the wars, a decree of the government to close 11 library branches. And suddenly there's been a massive turnout of the population. Everybody from local African-American inhabitants to anarchists to anyone in between, all joining forces to say, our children deserve some libraries. This kind of mobilization from below is something I think we're going to see an enormous amount more of 
in the years to come. It doesn't by itself define what the government is doing. Because when we think of the basic characteristics of this Bush-Cheney administration that Alice Kessler Harris has outlined for you so neatly, the promise of a thousand years of war, to use a phrase that Bush used one time, war to save civilization, namely us versus terror. The promise then of free markets and indeed not only the notion that if markets are somehow left untouched, all will always work for the best. Leaving always aside just how free are these markets she's talking about. Are they at all like, let's say, the markets of an Arab bazaar, where people sit down individually and hassle over prices? When was the last time you did that uh, with something that you were buying in a market? place. Hmm? Oh, clearly this is free corporate enterprise is what has been covered by this slogan of the beauty, the infallibility of market decisions. A third element which I think deserves mention in this, however, is the new power of the administrative state. Powers taken on by agencies above and beyond the law. No place, I think, is this clear, though it's clear in the whole bumbling uh, Home Security Administration, Homeland Security Administration, but clear is most of all in the Department of Labor, which for the first time in its history has been run by somebody explicitly and openly hostile to labor unions, Secretary Chow, and who has used her office to virtually shut down Safety and Health Administration, to shut down even the seemingly impregnable mine inspection, because mining companies generally liked government mine inspections. But the government now has cut that out, and we're beginning to see the disasters reappearing uh, around the land. Putting a thousand new people to work in the Department of Labor, checking the books of every local union in the United States, while removing all the regulations that were on employers uh, in the United States. This kind of new power being issued by administrative decree, I think, is an essential part of this link of the promise of war and of the free market, so-called. On the war promise, and on all the three of those, however, those of us here, especially historians, this is supposed to be our profession, always have to ask ourselves just what's new. After all, there are long precedents for much of what the Bush and Cheney administration have been doing. And sorting out what was building up since World War II with what new level of horror has come with the Bush Cheney administration, I think is an extremely important part uh, for us to play. Take, for example, the glorification of free markets. The whole administration over the world of the International Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, has all been devoted to the forcing, the privatization of industry and the turning over of all resources to foreign investments, creating local economies into export economies, export of goods, and perhaps unintentionally, export of people on a massive scale uh, around the world. This is all there, after all. NAFTA stands out very much in our minds, but we think of how the whole economy of Mexico was privatized in preparation for Mexico, for, the, for NAFTA. Mm -hmm. NAFTA simply signed on the dotted line of what was done. And this is now evident in the great strike in Cananea mines. Mexican historians among you, the very name Cananea should have you up. This is where the revolutionary struggle began uh, in 1906. And now the workers have been on strike for two years against a new private owner that has been introduced into uh, those pits. Here then is the question that we must face, first of all, on the war program. 
The phrase that Rumsfeld came up with, shock and awe, I think stands out as the crucial thing. That we see ourselves holding, uh, Rumsfeld after all never wanted to increase the infantry very much. But he always wanted to have power to bomb, and bomb anything into oblivion. A doctrine that has, is being repeated right before our eyes, of course, in the Gaza Strip today. But here was the notion then that we could single-handedly bend anyone uh, to the will of the United States. And in the marketplace, we've seen emerge, I think, not only this absolute glorification of private ownership. Again, not entirely new. It was Margaret Thatcher who first came up with the idea that if you put in private ownership of homes, you will destroy socialism uh, in the Labour Party uh, in England. So here, again, this idea is taken over to the United States, but turned into a form of mobilizing, absolutely speculative, runaway capitalism, running away with such disastrous results that even Albert Greenspan has confessed his errors. The notion that you see people from big banking corporations now today say, we went too far, means that the question is, how far back do you go and what comes in their place? These are the new innovations, a new level of scale, and indeed a qualitatively new ideal the U.S. alone could control and dominate the globe with its power to destroy. The question then is, that we have taken up here in Historians Against the War, is first of all how to end the war in Iraq and the many wars that have come around it. And certainly our campaigning had a great deal to do with the large-scale mobilization that made Obama place ending the war in Iraq at the center of the few things that he talked about explicitly. Uh, in his uh, campaign programs. But it also has meant that these great hopes that emerged out of the fall of 2008, along with the economic crisis and ever-growing numbers of unemployed, have left us the task then of not only building on these hopes among the American people to try and redefine the promise and perils of the world in which we find ourselves, but also mobilize to see to it that Obama keeps these promises and indeed to help define them more explicitly. The question of health care that Alice Kessler Harris talked about is right up at the top of the agenda. But right behind it, the question of we have a new Secretary of Labor, friendly to immigrants of all things. Hmm? friendly to immigrants throughout the country, and indeed friendly to reconstructing the kind of Labor Department policies that Madam Perkins uh, once stood for. But even the New York Times asked the question, how much support will she get from Obama? Because he surrounded himself with people from the major banks who say the worst thing we can do in a crisis is to disturb workplace relations. All right, clearly our role as a public is going to be crucial in helping to define the answers to these questions. What do we mean by bailed out? Who gets bailed out and under what terms? Do we do it by reducing everybody's living standard, as was done in the General Motors bailout? Or do we do it by building up purchasing power so that we can pull ourselves out of this long-term crisis? This means that a major task before all of us now is not only to keep open, but to broaden the discussion of not only what kind of a world we want to get rid of, the one that Bush and Cheney have given us, but what kind of a world we want to create. And as we think about this, as many ideas on that as there are people here, all right, let's get together and exchange them and see what kind of joint activities we come up with. I think of the cartoon in the New Times, the paper of the Chicago Federation of Labor in 1919 with a door that says, Versailles Conference. And outside of it are a bunch of workers banging on the door. 
They say, you couldn't make war without us, you can't make peace without us. That should be our slogan. Our next speaker is Vijay Prasad, Prashad, and uh, he is the George and Martha Kellner Chair of South Asian History and Professor and Director of the International Studies Program at Trinity College. His latest book is The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World. Two of his books, Karma of Brown Folk and Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting, were chosen by the Village Voice as Books of the Year. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Van, and thanks, Margaret, for inviting me to be on a panel. Uh, I feel quite humbled to be here among you. Uh, this is, of course, an organization founded in anticipation of the war in Iraq, but uh, as the war in Iraq was happening, we were already at war, uh, not just in Afghanistan, but uh, at 182 places around the planet where we have located our military in anticipation of escalating hostilities wherever we feel the need. But uh, perhaps when we formed in uh, 2003, we should have sent a better Arabic translator to Washington, D.C., because apparently Father Jami and Kanan Makia had forgotten that uh, the sentences that the Iraqis were intoning then, they were not saying you'll be greeted with flowers, but you'll be greeted with shoes. So <laughs> perhaps uh, it might be a good idea to give them better Arabic translations. <laughs> I'm going to be a bit of a damp squib. Uh, and although I agree that uh, the uh, door to hope has opened domestically, I think in terms of foreign policy and war policy, uh, it is quite a different scenario. That uh, the question of hope was on the table immediately on November 5th and right before then. Uh, but I think uh, it seems to be narrowing once more. There is Gaza. There is relative silence. Now, the Bush administration's legacy would have cheered on the Israeli government and said, bomb them more, bomb them harder. The Obama administration, yes, a better line, we need to have a ceasefire. But yet the narrative is similar. So I'm going to talk a little bit against the idea of presidential time to look at American history through the era of one president to the next and suggest that even though we might be agreed on the personal stupidity of George Bush, that the continuities between, say, Carter onward are quite astounding on the level of foreign policy. That is to say, not domestic policy. So I would like to lay out a narrative of continuity against the question of presidential time. I'm going to rely a little bit on my book quickly to frame uh, that story, and then I'm going to talk specifically about how I understand U.S. foreign policy and then the possibilities uh, before us in this period to come. The narrative first. In 1983, Fidel Castro, who I must say he must be thrilled, uh, you know, in Santiago just a few days ago, 50 years ago, he celebrated the revolution. Perhaps the singular most important revolution after the Second World War, uh, even much more important, I would say, than the Chinese Revolution. Such a disaster in the long term. But uh, the Cuban Revolution, what a historical achievement, and so little recognized. The New York Times had the indecency after Matthews's coverage at that time to just report from Miami and to give no coverage from Havana or from Santiago anywhere in Cuba. But nevertheless, in 1983, Castro comes to the non-aligned meeting in New Delhi and says that it is time now for all us countries, 170 plus countries, we are under attack from the International Monetary Fund. We are under attack from the advanced capitalist countries who are in the middle of a problem. They are entering a downslope. They are going to now try to get us into a debt crisis, he said. Mexico had already happened the previous year. He said, we are all going to go under. We need to have a international strike against debt servicing payments. We need to use our own value that we are creating out of our hard work to build our national infrastructures, to create mutual trade, and not to send debt servicing back to the you know, advanced industrial countries to get them out of their slump that they are in the middle of. Of course, Castro lost the day. One of 
the great defeats in Castro's career was the non-aligned meeting in 1983 because that money that flooded from south to north helped provide an early bubble which then enters the financialization structure, etc. It's a very long and complicated story and I wish we had time to enter the discussion of the long-term trajectory of this financial crisis. It's not just deregulation in the US domestic scene, it's also the way international imperialism was restructured in the late 1970s and early 1980s. So that occurs. While this is occurring, many of these countries which had made commitments to their population, social democratic commitments, these countries reneged on their commitments in the 1980s, national, some cases revolutionary, some cases national democratic states lost their legitimacy. From the margins in each of these states comes the fires of fury. Political organizations which had been marginalized up to the 1980s, organizations whose primary identification was religion, or ethnicity, etc., made a dramatic and important emergence in the 1980s. For instance, what we now call political Islam, or in India, the Hindutva movement, the right-wing Hindu movement, or indeed in Israel, when Likud, for the first time, comes to office in the late 1970s, having been marginalized by labor before then, the entry of the right, whose new shape is no longer in its cruel manifestation, but puts itself forward as the defender of the majority, either religion or ethnicity. These forces emerge. The United States' response to this is characteristic. And let's take the two ends of the spectrum. One, the Gulf, the other, Afghanistan. And it is true, as Alice Kessler Harris very importantly pointed out, that terrorism begins to be the word, the idea that replaces the Cold War or communism. But there's another word, which is oil. There are two important events that I want to put forward for our consideration from the late 1970s as these switches are occurring. Oil, the Carter Doctrine, enunciated in 1980, where Jimmy Carter essentially put forward the view that the security of Saudi Arabia was the security of the United States. It's a very important doctrine. It has had catastrophic effects for uh, the Middle East and, of course, for the ability of the United States to be the so-called honest broker in the region. The Carter Doctrine. On the other end of that very large piece of land, on the other end, the United States under Brzezinski's uh, prodding and pushing uh, starts to help finance the far-right uh, elements in Afghan society to fight against an internally combusting uh, you know, People's Democratic Revolution in Afghanistan. So people like Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, for instance, who makes his reputation throwing acid in the face of women uh, students at the University of Kabul in the engineering faculty, get funding from Brzezinski's uh, minions to start a direct armed struggle against the, the People's Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. These are the two ends, these are the two responses. How to fight against this new globalized uh, right? they select the military option. This begins in 1979 and 1980. Put that there. Now, I want to just lay out some implications from these and then come to the present era. You will have to guide me two, three minutes in advance. <laughs> um, I would argue that between the 1970s and the present, there have been two separate, perhaps you might consider them tactical uh, approaches followed by the two major bourgeois parties in the United States. One is an approach which we might consider from the Bush-Cheney era of unilateral imperialism, where it's a go it alone, screw everybody else, we're going to do it. This was also there in Reagan. Screw everybody, we're going to do it. Bolton and those crowd, they were, they fed on that doctrine in the Reagan administration. The United Nations is a hindrance. Screw it. Let's just go and bomb. We can do it. Let's bomb Grenada. Let's bomb in Beirut. Let's just prop up, make really tight pals with the right wing in Israel, etc. That was one line. And the Republicans mainly supported that line, although, by the way, lots of friendly Democrats, including, you know, uh, of course, uh, at the, what's his name, uh, the mentor of Wolfowitz. Uh, Lieberman. Not Lieberman. 
Not Pearl. Scoop Jackson. Scoop Jackson. Jackson. Correct. Scoop Jackson. Sorry. How could I have forgotten his name? What a great name. Scoop Jackson. <laughs> Friendly Democrats were there in Congress for this line. The second line is a multilateral imperialism. When they say multilateralism in this section of the Democratic Party foreign policy elite, they don't mean you listen to what people in, in Palestine are saying. What they mean is Britain, Germany, France, all the old colonial powers, the members of the United, uh, United Nations Security Council and themselves, as long as everybody listens to America. It's basically the American line, but all these former colonial powers have to tag along. This is what they mean by multilateralism. In a sense, it shuts out the 170, 175 you know, uh, countries in the world. This is not genuine multilateralism. This is multilateral imperialism. Multilateral in name, but imperialism nonetheless. Still, there are some differences which I recognize. That's the, I think, the kind of tweedledee, tweedledum that we see in foreign policy over this terrain. What are, what are the ways in which US foreign policy has operated? One, is in, we have to recognize the structural role played by the right in societies like, say, Egypt or Pakistan or India. Take Pakistan as an example. Pakistan undergoes IMF uh, restructuring in the 1970s, around the time of the United States beginning to write a check to uh, Pakistan regularly. You know, this checkbook thing starts in the 1950s. Tariq Ali recounts a wonderful story where Jinnah tries to rent his house to the American ambassador uh, who had the terrific name All Wine. Uh, but anyway, uh, that, uh, you know, kind of Dalalism, what we call, you know, the attempt of uh, selling, mer you know, petty merchanting yourself for, to the Americas had a long history. But nonetheless, from the 70s, Pakistan cuts its spending by IMF uh, diktat on health and education. Well, once you cut health and education, you open the door for all kinds of faith-based organizations to come in and start providing health and education. And this is what indeed happens. In other words, the right plays a structural role in these societies. It is not some kind of uh, entity that can just be taken out by bombs. It is now playing the role of genuinely the opium of the masses, not just ideologically, but also in fact in practical terms. Because we have decided that health and, and uh, education should not be a state function through the IMF. So we must understand that first point, the structural role played by the right in these societies. Anybody who thinks about Hamas, for instance, or Hezbollah and doesn't understand this is ignorant of the fundamental facts of the role of these organizations, or indeed Lashkari Taiba, which just conducted the Mumbai attack. It's linked to healthcare provision. In Murtike, where they have the headquarters, they provide, they are the only healthcare provider in the area. It's very difficult for the Pakistani state to close them down. You close them down, there's a healthcare emergency. First thing, the structural role of these right-wing forces. Secondly, there was a failure to demobilize the jihad. I'm just now going to go to the Pakistani side. There's no time on the other way. After the 1980s war in Afghanistan, when the civil war began to slowly uh, give itself out to the Taliban, Many of the veterans of the Afghan Jihad had the erroneous idea that they were the ones who won the war against the Soviets. So they then went home. They went to Chechnya. They went to the Philippines. They went to Egypt. They went to Saudi Arabia. And those from Pakistan went into the struggle in Kashmir. That struggle begins again in 1992 in earnest and is taken over by this section. They will base themselves. Lashkari Taiba, for instance, is formed not in Pakistan, but in the Kunar province of Afghanistan in 1991. The jihad was insufficiently demobilized. We have to understand that as well, that these are not some entities that have come from prehistory. You know, if you take that whole section of the uh, Pathan region, the Pathan region of Afghanistan, it has a glorious history of uh, non-religious activism, and it continues to. You know, uh, the Awami Party won the last election in that Waziristan area. And by the way, Bangladesh, Henry Kissinger's basket case. On New Year's, the greatest gift, the Awami Party swamped the election. It won, it's the largest plurality in parliament. The Islamists won less than the Socialist Party in Bangladesh a few days ago. An incredible victory for secular forces in, in Bangladesh and in the borderlands of uh, Pakistan in last year's election. 
These are things that are not seen. Obama talks about uh, Pakistan. He's the first American president who can actually say Pakistan. But in the same sentence, he says, I want to bomb Pakistan. He's not <laughs> understanding you know, the contradictions in these societies, that there are elements that can be pushed and promoted and brought forward, that you cannot complete this crisis if you don't understand the cause. We have to demobilize the jihad of the Afghan war. We have to go back and decontaminate that zone that we have created. That's the second thing. The third thing is Washington has consistently uh, disregarded its own role by playing favorites in this process. One is our friend, another is our friend. And you see very quickly the friends Washington chooses are those without a mass base or whose mass base, because they become friends, is quickly denuded. Fatah, super example. You have a mass base, suddenly Washington is your pal, Washington wants you to win an election, you're going to lose the election. Why? Because everybody understands Washington's structural role in their social de maldevelopment. And we have to recognize that. So, very quickly, you know, uh, my feeling is that we as historians need to be making this point over because the bourgeois historians are going to say the era of Bush and Cheney is over. We are now in the era of Obama. Everything is great. Now we'll be greeted with flowers when we send more troops to Afghanistan. It is our role to say no, that this is a long-term trajectory. We have a long-term problem. We need to have long-term understandings of solutions and that troops are not going to solve the problem. Troops are going to inflame the situation even more. Obama very cleverly and, and very disappointingly to me ran the election saying Afghanistan was the good war and Iraq was the wrong war. We cannot allow that to be doxa. We need to challenge that at every instance and we need to demonstrate that Afghanistan is the long war, not the right war. Iraq is the wrong war. Afghanistan is the long war and both need to be put a stop to. Thanks very much. Our next speaker is Ellen Schrecker. She is a professor of history at Yeshiva University. She is the author of many articles and books, among which are Many Are the Crimes, McCarthyism in America, No Ivory Tower, McCarthyism and the Universities, Cold War Triumphalism, Exposing the Misuse of History After the Fall of Communism, as well as an excellent cookbook on Chinese cooking. Um, <laughs> and she is currently writing two books. One is a general study of repression in the United States, and one is on contemporary academic, the contemporary academic scene. Um, hi. I timed myself this morning and uh, went way over. <laughs> so I'm going to talk very fast. Uh, and of course, because I've written so much about McCarthyism and civil liberties, I'm often asked whether the uh, current administration's assault on civil liberties uh, is worse than earlier ones. And being I hope a careful historian, I always give a very nuanced reply. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> uh, one element that is certainly consistent and that my colleague Vijay Prasad uh, noted is the continuity with earlier episodes of political oppression, really from the Alien and Sedition Act or up to the present. Um, and one major continuity is the use and the ex exploitation of a crisis as an opportunity to expand the government's power and to silence its opponents. This usually occurs with the rationalization that the protection of national security requires the subordination of ordinary constitutional protections. Um, now, not all the current infringements of people's rights, obviously, stem from 9-11. Uh, in 1996, for example, uh, Congress and the Clinton administration affected the quote-unquote Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act that created a new crime of quote-unquote material support for a 
quote unquote foreign terrorist organization. And it was so vaguely framed that in fact, if you had given money to Nelson Mandela's ANC, you might have gotten into trouble. But it's clear that 9-11 ramped up uh, political repression. And we need to recognize, I think, the extraordinary level of panic that there was in Washington in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, especially with that, uh, remember the anthrax scare? Mm -hmm. um, and the administration was terrified, just terrified. They really feared a recurrence. And their gut reaction was to get tough. Uh, they, I think, sincerely believed that and I think incorrectly, that coercion was the most effective means of response. And they also, one has to note, took advantage of this crisis to implement a long-standing wish list. The most obvious of these, of course, is the uh, invasion of Iraq, which the neoconservative hawks had been um, eager for. We've seen the CIA, for example, uh, finding it possible to get the administration to sign off on coercive measures that previously had been rendered, uh, been considered politically impossible. We've seen the Department of Justice, for example, um, getting the ability to roll back restrictions on government actions through the USA Patriot Act, which just whisked through Congress. And uh, those of you who know it may realize this is 362 pages of totally unintelligible bureaucratic <laughs> prose, which is mainly amending earlier laws. And it actually took ACLU lawyers several weeks to figure out what was in the law. The crisis also allowed the administration to implement its notion of what came to be called the unitary executive. Um, this was a particular project of our beloved Vice President Cheney to restore and expand the powers of the executive branch that he believed had been uh, seriously curtail curtailed in the 1970s after Watergate. And um, this, uh, we see the DNA of this particular project in many of the measures that were taken by the current administration. Above all, I think, in its assumption that it is somehow above the law. And in the many measures that it has taken to avoid accountability, mainly through secrecy. This has been the most secretive administration in recent American history. Uh, we see it as well in the refusal to acknowledge the power of other branches of the government. Um, the Bush administration has defied Congress. We see this, for example, in Bush's quote unquote signing statements in which he will sign a law and then uh, accompany that signature with a weaselly statement that he might not enforce it. Uh, we've seen it as well in measures that were taken to uh, circumvent the courts, especially with regard to surveillance and the detention of prisoners. And all of these measures, I want to emphasize, rely on that invocation of national security and on the claim that they are inherent in the president's powers as commander in chief. Now let's look at some of what's been done and I'll try to compress this as much as possible. Um, let's look, for example, at the illegal detentions and interrogations of, prince, of prisoners which are clearly the most blatantly illegitimate assumption of power by the Bush White House. And of course, the administration justifies all these measures as necessary to prevent further, quote unquote, terrorist attacks. Uh, from the start, the government had been holding people without charges. Uh, in the United States, this began immediately after 9-11 with the roundup and detention of thousands of immigrants, mainly Muslims and people from the Middle East and South Asia. Overseas, we've seen the CIA and the military uh, capturing and detaining unknown numbers of people. 
and the administration facilitating all of that by developing the so-called enemy combatant status in order to evade the Geneva Conventions. Uh, the government has also violated the Constitution by eliminating due process in a number of areas, denying um, the writ of habeas corpus, which would allow people access uh, detainees access to the courts and developing uh, these military commissions that operate without the normal constitutional measures of due process. Um, we've seen Guantanamo as well as at least eight so-called black sites in places we don't know where they are, uh, probably somewhere like uh, Morocco or Eastern Europe. Um, places where the government was trying to ensure that American legal protections did not apply. Worst of all has been the treatment of these detainees, uh, the use of what has euphemistically been called enhanced interrogation practices, i.e. torture, and the uh, practice of renditions in which the uh, government sends prisoners to third countries uh, where, as we know, they will be tortured. There's also been an enormous increase in surveillance, both of citizens and foreigners alike. Uh, under the Patriot Act, for example, the FBI has issued more than 200,000 national security letters uh, to libraries, bookstores, corporations, asking for information about all kinds of people. The National Security Agency, we know, has done a considerable amount of wire, uh, warrantless wiretapping. Um, that the administration authorized in order to avoid legal requirements for review by the uh, so-called FISA courts, foreign intelligence um, security courts. Um, we've seen some successful, some unsuccessful attempts to collect data. The government has been trying to do a lot of data mining uh, especially the Department of Defense, and has been collecting information under the rubric, as Alice has pointed out, of terrorism on all kinds of, uh, all forms of internal dis uh, dissent. Much of this has been secret, and I think this secrecy is really a key to the uh, Bush administration's methods of operation, because even before 9-11, if you recall, Cheney was trying to conceal um, the personnel of his um, energy task force from the public, and this has been something that has in only increased after to over time, uh, and intensified, of course, after 9-11. Uh, in the months after 9-11, for example, the Attorney General began to roll back the Freedom of Information Act, refusing to uh, grant um, access to many government records that had previously been open. The Patriot Act contained so-called gag orders, under which institutions who were asked for information on individuals and groups uh, were not allowed to talk about those requests, not even to reveal they had occurred. Uh, the government has uh, greatly increased the number of documents that have been uh, classified. Uh, roughly 50% of those documents, according to one expert, have been incorrectly classified. Um, particularly serious. Uh, here has been the administration's reliance on the notion of state secrets as a way of um, making it impossible to bring lawsuits against the government in the area of national security. And there has also been, and I think this is just as serious, the use of uh, confidential legal rulings by the administration uh, by the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel, like the notorious torture memo by John Yeo. 
there's been uh, outright repression of dissent as well, often as the result of collaboration between federal and local officials that has resulted in the roundup of legal dissenters uh, at the time, for example, of the 2004 Republican Convention in New York, and more recently this summer in St. Paul when the uh, Department of Justice raided uh, a number of uh, dissenting groups. Um, Barbara, I know, is going to talk a little bit about some other measures that have uh, limited academic freedom. So I just want to uh, conclude by asking what kind of generalizations we can make about this Bush and Cheney assault on our basic freedoms. And one that's it, very obvious is that it's counterproductive. It doesn't increase American security. Uh, people know very well that torture does not necessarily produce valid information, but only the information that the victims think that the torturers would like them to give. Uh, these uh, things like Tor Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib have certainly alienated allies uh, overseas that we that uh, are needed for um, dealing with the issue. Uh, and also, um, from a law enforcement perspective, there's too much information. Uh, the FBI has really found itself swamped. It doesn't have very many Arabic uh, interpreters. And uh, they don't want all this stuff that the NSA has been scooping up. They can't deal with it. Um, more seriously, of course, what the administration has been doing is essentially undermining American democracy and the rule of law. Um, so what should Obama do? It's pretty obvious. Close Guantanamo, end renditions, restore the rule of law, repeal most of the Patriot Act, restore open govern government, and the surveillance of dissenters. Um, you know, it's a pretty obvious wish list. Uh, unfortunately, it probably isn't politically uh, feasible to conduct war crimes trials of uh, people like Bush and Cheney, although it is clear, and I just heard a wonderful presentation by the director of the Center for Constitutional Rights explaining that legally these people really are war criminals. Um, so what should we ask for? Maybe some kind of Truth and Reconciliation Commission that would demonstrate that no one is above the law. Actually, I'm not very optimistic about all of this, uh, not optimistic about the fact that uh, it will be possible to avoid similar violations of individual rights in the future. Um, this seems to occur almost inevitably in a time of crisis. And I think unless we can see a greater degree of skepticism within the media, within Congress, within the American population about the um, inevitable uh, demand that we must sacrifice our rights in the name of national security, I think we're probably see a recurrence some other time. Thank you. Um, my, the next speaker is Barbara Weinstein, and she is the immediate past president of the American Historical Association. And I just want to say, mm -hmm. I had numerous conversations with people who said, oh, great, another perspective with a column by Barbara. I can't wait to read it. And that's the first time that's ever happened to me. But in any case, uh, and she's a professor of history at New York University. She is the author of the Amazon Rubber Boom, 1850 to 1920, and for Social Peace in Brazil, Industrialists and the Remaking of the Working Class in Sao Paulo. She is currently working, uh, currently completing a book on race, gender, and regional identity in Brazil. She is a member of the editorial collective of the Radical History Review and co-editor of the Duke University Press book series, Radical Perspectives. Not historic that uh, the person with the W name goes last, so. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm in a position where I knew I was going to go last, and I decided I would talk about things that were unlikely to be mentioned by the other members of the panel. And I hope they're still relatively interesting things to talk about, but perhaps a little bit more narrowly focused than some of the other discussions. Uh, but I, before I start, I want to thank Margaret and Van for organizing this. And uh, to say, also, I want to say personally to Margaret how much I appreciated her defense of me on the history in the History News Network uh, last year uh, when um, the a column was reproduced without comment from no no offense, Rick. Um, <laughs> so, um, from uh, Front Page Magazine, it's an e-zine, uh, David Horowitz's um, online magazine, about me as the radical AHA president, <laughs> which I, of course, didn't take as offensive at all. But, <laughs> so uh, so uh, my thank you to uh, Margaret for, for that. Um, Obviously, talking about the legacy of the Bush-Cheney regime, and I'm going to use regime here because we often, Latin, as many of you know, I'm a, a Latin American historian, we often refer to the Vargas regime, et cetera, but we always refer to the Bush-Cheney administration. And we know that regime has a more, you know, an, a kind of more pejorative implication and administration is more neutral. So I'd like to use regime today to underline the pejorative sense of the, the, uh, of the administration. Um, to talk about its legacy is not quite the same as talking about its impact or consequences, um, in part because the impact and consequences often aren't necessarily in any direct way connected to the kinds of discourses, policies, um, uh, ideologies promoted by a particular regime. So in, in some sense, the impact of the Bush-Cheney regime is, is hard to talk about because it's a regime that's already producing its own negation in many different areas. So for example, no one, hardly anyone right now is talking about cutting government spending. Uh, and imagine hearing the phrase in public discourse, privatizing social security. I mean, that's, you know, th that's about as dead an idea as you could possibly imagine. So there are all sorts of things, there are all sorts of consequences of this regime that clearly were not intended by the key actors or the key ideologies that motivated and activated this regime. If, for example, in Latin America, one of the sort of jokes that circulates among my friends is that the indifference and hostility of this administration to the um, to Latin America generally, Latin American issues in particular, um, certain Latin American issues in particular, helps to account for the revival of the left in many places in Latin America. But again, we don't really want to talk about that as a legacy of the Bush-Cheney <laughs> regime exactly. Um, so, though it certainly may be a consequence of it. So what I'm going to try to do is focus briefly, because I kept on saying, that, oh no, let them talk, I'll give up some of my time. You know, but, which really was a lie, I had no intention of giving up my time. Um, so, um, but uh, so I just want to, but I will try to be brief, focus briefly on a few things that I think are not only legacies of specifically of the Bush Cheney regime, although of course certainly all of these things um, emerge out of longer periods of shifts in American, uh, in U.S. politics, and particularly U.S. foreign policy, but also some domestic stuff that I'll talk about. Um, so I'm not saying that there is no that the, this emerges de novo from the Bush-Cheney regime, but I think there are specific aspects of it that will, that have shifted the political landscape and that will be particularly difficult to undo, even in the most optimistic interpretation of what the Obama administration, I won't call it the Obama regime, the Obama administration promises <laughs> to for the future. One that I'd like to talk about. Again, I'm going to sort of, there are going to be sort of more narrow issues, but um, something that I've written about in those perspectives columns is the issue, uh, is the impact of the Patriot Act on uh, the movement of scholars and others across international boundaries. As our 
as the academic world, as the intellectual community has become more and more globalized, more and more internationalized, um, as we become more and more interested as historians in transnational history, it has become more and more difficult for scholars to move, particularly across the boundaries of the United States. And the, uh, the case I talked about, Waskarari eventually had a, a, a happy ending. He eventually got his visa, but under the terms of the Patriot Act, he could have been um, continuously denied a visa without any explanation, without any um, explanation being given either to him or to his now employer, the University of Nebraska. And now it is very possible that key features of the Patriot Act will be changed, but one of the last places to change in terms of the sort of international network of U.S. presence abroad are the consular personnel. Consular personnel are unlikely to be changed anytime soon, and their enormous fear of letting somebody into the United States who will do something to harm someone in the United States won't go away anytime soon because they are, you know, they've been given such a sense that, you know, that of course their career is over if they let anyone in who either harms someone or talks about harming someone, which let me say is not as we know, not quite the same thing. Um, and talking about harming someone can be interpreted simply as giving support to some group that engages in any kind of armed struggle. Yeah. Hence my being uh, chewed out in that article for comparing Che Guevara to George Washington. So, but, um, <laughs> so, but, um, so. Uh, but Chade never had slaves. So anyhow, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me say that in addition to the fact that consular officials are almost certainly going to continue to give a hard time to anyone they consider it to be ideologically unfriendly to the United States, that it's, it's very important to keep in mind that in many nations where there are scholars who for one reason or another want to come to the United States, participate in conferences like this conference, that it's now required in places like India and Brazil that you do a personal face-to-face -face interview with the consular official in order to get a visa, even just to travel to the U.S. as a tourist never mind to um, come and teach for six months or a year. In many parts of uh, Latin America, Asia, these kinds of requirements would uh, cost an enormous amount of money because there are only a few consular posts. So it costs hundreds of dollars just to get to the consular post and apply, sometimes thousands, just to apply for the um, visa. So the structure of screening out people from countries we regard as um, either to be sources of illegal immigrants, people who will overstay their visa, or to be sources of scholars who might be critical or hostile to the United States, that this apparatus will still keep out either directly or indirectly many people that we would want to come and be in the US to be able to have the right, if they choose to, to come to a conference here to teach here um, or simply to visit here. Now, just, and also let me say often these interviews can be quite personally humiliating. And even to very eminent scholars, such as an Indian scientist who's some, something of a national hero who was repeatedly denied a visa after dozens of trips to the United States for scientific conventions. Um, I just want to say quickly about the uh, Latin possible um, impact for Latin America policy of the Bush-Cheney regime, that among their innovations, which again continue things that preceded their years in office, but often harden certain things, you have, for example, the hardening of the embargo on Cuba. So it's not as if the embargo is new. The embargo has been going on since the early 1960s, but it has become much harder under the Bush-Cheney regime. It has become much more um, stringent, much more restrictive, making it even difficult to send medicines and emergency foodstuffs to Cuba during the repeated natural disasters that have afflicted the island. One, let me say, one collateral effect of this is that I think he, they have succeeded in alienating many people, even in the Cuban-American American um, community in Florida, particularly younger Cuban Americans who would like to be able to travel more freely to Cuba. Um, I will make a 
an optimistic, I, I generally agree with Vijay Prashad's not very optimistic take on the future of foreign policy under Obama, but one optimistic pred pred prediction I would like to make is that the embargo will end while Obama is president. What kind of impact that will have on Cuba is another matter, but again, I think here we have to impose, oppose the embargo, even if the ending of the embargo is not necessarily going to have all the implications we would like. Um, funding of Plan Colombia um, has made, uh, has strengthened the right wing of the Colombian military, which some people I think would argue is the entire Colombian military, but I hope perhaps not. Um, but has certainly made the Colombian military much more willing to engage in severe human rights violations. And uh, what, again, one small uh, bright point is that I think that there will be at least some revision in U.S. policy toward Colombia, but I suspect not um, a root and branch rethinking of Plan Colombia. Uh, Pre-trade agreements were um, negotiated, several were, are either still being negotiated or were negotiated under Bush-Cheney with no labor and environmental protection provisions. Um, with continuing stress on privatization of resources and the reducing of government spending. So you have a continuous line of the sort of the IMF um, sponsored policies. And I think those free trade agreements will be, um, some of them will be modified, but they'll be hard to undo. One of the reasons, ironic reasons they'll be hard to undo is that so many Latin American economies are now really plugged into this, that in fact, there is a fear among people in Latin America, even people I'll talk to on, let's say, the moderate left, that there is a fear that protectionism in the United States will have a very negative impact on their economies. So I think what this shows is the way in which the whole landscape of the political economy has shifted in much of Latin America and places like Brazil and Chile, so that they're really so plugged into this kind of political economy that it's hard to even for them to imagine how to break free of it. Um, that, let me just say, very quickly, um, a few things about uh, the, situ the implication for university life in the U.S. as a result of the policies and the climate created by the Bush-Cheney regime. Um, one, I think we're all very aware of, is that even public universities are now increasingly dependent upon corporate funding and also tuition payments to survive, even pr public universities get a smaller and smaller portion of their budget from the state. And while on the one hand that might seem like a good thing at a moment of, in, of huge um, cuts in state spending, on the other hand it means that corporations and um, corporate representatives, corporate interests have more and more of an impact on the kinds of decisions that are made in both public and certainly in private universities. Um, I think we will continue to see attempts by outside groups, that is groups outside of the academy, to intervene in the decision making about hiring and tenuring on uh, promoting in the academy. And while I'm certainly not opposed to outside groups having some sort of impact on academic life, I do not advocate the ivory tower view, on the other hand, most of this mobilization around issues of tenure um, and promotion have been mobilizations to limit academic freedom and speech rather than to promote it. And I think that will continue to go on. I think the business model of education that is clearly uh, established at the university level has also um, expanded enormously at the K through 12 level, and I think not only is that going to be hard to undo, but I think so far the signs are there is in fact no intention on the part of the Obama government to undo that business model, but rather to perhaps modify No Child Left Behind and, uh, and sort of learning outcomes discourse, but not necessarily to shift away from the idea that the reason we don't have better schools in the United States is because teachers work don't work hard enough and have too many rights. And if we just take away their rights, take away their tenure, and um, you know, force them to work even harder, that somehow these schools will be better. Um, finally, 
Um, since I'm, I'm sure we, we want to have some time. I, it's okay, well, just one thing, carceral society. Clearly another thing that's been intensified under Bush and Cheney is the ten tendency to spend on prisons, to privatize um, imprisonment, and also to extend prison sentences. It's not just that we imprison many more people per capita in this country than almost every other country in the world, but that are the sentences uh, that people um, are, are, that are handed down in courts are much longer. And this will shift only very slowly because those lower level courts are the ones where the personnel will change most slowly. Finally, something I was very struck by in the recent electoral campaign. And we're all familiar with the repeated attempts to tarnish Obama's candidacy by associating him with Bill Ayers on the argument that Bill Ayers was involved with a terrorist group, he, that he was involved with people who at one time built bombs that might have hurt some people at some time if they had ever been used, et cetera, et cetera. We all know, in fact, they mainly hurt themselves, not other people. Um, so there were repeated references to Obama's relationship to somebody who could have been involved in terrorist acts. What I found really striking is that I did not hear, and certainly in any mainstream, but not even in non-mainstream fora, any discussion of uh, John McCain's wartime service, except to talk about how heroic he was and how much he suffered. Leaving the issue of suffering aside, this is a man who uh, ran repeating bombing missions over North Vietnam and undoubtedly killed many, many people who were not in any way involved in combat during those missions, and never once was that even mentioned as something to consider in thinking about him as a presidential candidate or a human being. And I think that this is something that comes out of the shift in political discourse, the constant um, refrain of support our troops, even if we oppose the war, support our troops, and never say anything about what, you know, the, what, Alice Kessler Harris very well uh, put very well, which is the negation of the human costs of war. Thank you very much. I can't, of course, I can't be, get into great specifics because the council, um, <laughs> the, 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 the council meetings are open, but they're sort of there. Um, I, I, let me say that I, of course, advocated and continue to advocate in, as recently as yesterday in the council meeting, the affiliation of historians against the war. The objection that was raised is that one of the existing, the sort of pre-existing, um, requirements of an affiliated society is that um, people not be excluded from that um, organization or association um, or society on, uh, for reasons extrinsic to the study of the past. So for example, if being against the war is a requirement to belong to historians against the war, then that's extrinsic to the study of the past. That was the argument used in the council. Now, the problem with that, I mean, just to say very quickly, uh, because this came up yesterday when we discussed and approved the affiliation of a Society for the Study of Medieval Feminists uh, 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 medieval feminist history. And I pointed out that feminist is clearly a political position. And it seemed extremely unlikely that they would invite someone to be a member of this group who was anti-feminist. Mm -hmm. And so the line between a political position and a theoretical methodological position within the historical prof profession I think has always been very blurry. I think it is even more now so that therefore we, it, and I was certainly in favor of affiliating the medieval feminist history group. <laughs> Let me say I was not opposed to this, but I felt that by the same logic historians against the war should be affiliated with the AHA. So that's my position. Clearly I was not the majority position. So as so often happens. Thank you. So, but, <laughs> Perhaps we'll take another question right here. Right. And I think we might want to think about adding an S maybe 
that's the trivial part. I wanted to come back to Yeah. about uh, the Secretary of Defense Robert Gates' proposal for a Minerva project. Have you heard about the yeah. Minerva yes. project? Yeah. Well, this is a military educational complex. He is proposing, and this is worked out, I, I've seen the his working out of this, a proposal to fund some aspects of the university, and as uh, Barbara Weinstein points out, you know they're going to be wanting more money, needing more money from various places, to focus on studies that will assist the military in its contemporary <laughs> needs, which brings me to, you know, Vijay's wonderful uh, exposition of the, the imperial needs. So I just want historians against the war to be aware of this, to consider, to study the Minerva project, to consider taking a position, and possibly to work with uh, groups in some of the other disciplines in making a public, taking a public position about it, because it's going to be very seductive to yeah. universities and to for many cash star universities yeah. who are going to be want, needing money for their work their research and saying, mm. oh, well, maybe it won't be directly harmful, you know. I'm sorry, I should have said, could you identify yourself and could every other speaker identify themselves? My fault. I'm sorry, we're not arriving home. Thanks, Renata. Um, over there. Could you, could you identify yourself? Well, my name is Patrick Daly. I'm uh, working towards a master's degree in history at the University of Connecticut. Before I even started this other career, uh, and I, I'm only prompted because of this Weinstein's last comments about John McCain. Now, I am a member of the historians against the war, although I believe it should be war. I'm not a terribly active member for lots of reasons, mostly time. But um, I was in Vietnam. I was part of an air crew that dropped bombs. I got shot down twice. Fortunately, I got picked up both times. So we can't criticize McKay. You can't criticize people because of things that they did at an earlier time in their life and knowing, without even knowing the reasons that led up to that. Um, I regret having been in that position and having done that, but I did, but I did. And to criticize, to criticize John McCain for that, I think it's the right thing to do to leave that alone. Unlike myself, he paid a tremendous price for it. And I think we should leave that as a wash. And, and, to, and to criticize him for doing that, you can criticize him for a lot of things he's done afterwards, but not to criticize him for that. You don't know what led up to it. You don't know. Uh, I don't know how many times I've woken up and I've said, but thanks but for the grace of God, I could have been there with him. So you can't criticize him. Let me, can I, I, I do, you know, first of all, I, I understand that this is at a sort of, a, you know, a level and a, you know, sort of a, a, a personal connection for you that I don't have to this issue. And I understand that, therefore, my response to his life would likely to be very different. But I think, I want to say two things. First, um, I want, I, you know, what, I, I think it's very important to emphasize he expresses no regret at all and in fact often will, has used this as something to promote his political career. And so I think that's very different from your situation of your own you know, uh, very uh, strong feelings about what happened and so on. So that's one thing. But the second thing, I mean, I would like to say that you know, I have quite a number of friends in Latin America, for example, who were imprisoned and tortured during various military dictatorships. And some of them took part in armed groups 
Some of them didn't, and some of them you know, just did nothing. Some of them were in armed groups. They um, talk about their, they're very self-critical about their, arm, their participation in armed struggle, for example, and their, petition, their uh, participation in violent act, even when they often really, you know, nobody was really harmed by them. Um, and they don't say, well, because I suffered and I was tortured, I don't, and let me say, I, you know, we're talking about really people who were just routinely tortured. Um, they don't say, my torturing gives me a pass. My, my having been tortured gives me a pass. I don't have to think critically about I, what I've done. I don't have to think critically about the possible violence that I did against other people. On the contrary, precisely because of what happened to them when they were imprisoned and when they were tortured, they feel even more acutely that they need to think very um, critically about their rush to armed struggle in a particular political situation. Uh, I've never seen even the slightest indication on John McCain's part that his experience moved him to rethink his own engagement with um, uh, violent um, actions. Yeah, so, that's yeah. a very good point yeah. there that I had thought of, but you know, uh, Could I well, just add a, oh, sure. a word, which is speaking both personally and as a historian, I look around the room and I wonder how many people have actually had bombs dropped on them. In other words, as historians, we presumably look at both sides of a question. And for every bombing mission that John McCain ran, I don't know how many people were hurt or killed or afraid or wounded or ran. And the question we have to ask ourselves as historians is what are the consequences of that for the individuals on whom the bombs were dropped, for their subjective experience, for their sense of what the United States is like, I could go on. But I don't think that the issue is an issue only of do we forgive or not forgive a particular individual. Uh, there, I think you're probably right. Question is whether bombing of civilians is ever, under any circumstances, something that a group of historians wants to think about without thinking about it from the perspective of the people on whom the bombs are dropped. Oh, you know what? No, no. I, I only, personally, I find this, I have to say, a very serious discussion. But we have very limited time, and I want to make sure we hear from a few more people, OK? So I'm going to start with Rusty Eisenberg, our colleague. So I was, first of all, I want to thank the members of the panel for a really interesting two hours. Um, and I think we should especially thank them for the 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 um, but as I was watching everybody struggle with their 10 minutes, <laughs> I was thinking that this is just the beginning of a conversation and how many thoughts we do have. And the extent to which I don't think historians' voices have been adequately heard on these issues and the need for that to happen going forward. Um, you know, people are setting sort of positive notes, having worked with historians against the war. On the one hand, I noticed that I haven't actually almost met a historian that's for the war, for almost anything about Bush and Cheney, I mean, even ever. But the truth is that even though Pa has continued and we've done great work and you know, it's been very positive, Histori given how opposed historians are to what's happening in the last eight years, the silence is very strong and it's very serious. And I think part of it is that we're not just historians, we're other things and people who participate in political activities, you know, in other roles, so I don't mean to discount that, but I also think that we have a tremendous amount to contribute and it's as important now in some ways more important that our voices be heard and that we're doing the educational work we can do. It's more important now almost than it has been for the past eight years. 
And so I want to encourage, this is now leading to a very trivial point. You know how the person always goes around with the little flyer? So a humble little thing that could happen is, you saw the thing about campus liaison. If we could have some person on every campus sign up to do that, and this is really like, it will take 10 minutes out of your whole life, but it would improve, like if we just had a person on campus where we're doing activities and they could share that information, or if there are ideas that people have on campuses and could bring it back, just that little flyer would be great. The second thing is that after this panel is over, one of the things we're going to talk about, and everybody's invited, if you say business meeting, you want to kill yourself, so boring. But we really need to talk about the role of this organization in the new period. I mean, somebody pointed out, we don't just have a war in Iraq. I mean, obviously, everybody's got Gaza on their minds right now. We have a huge economic crisis, which Paul has not addressed and, as, as an organization. Um, we have a military budget that's out of control. I mean, there's a range of issues, and we have to rethink a little bit you know, how we're actually functioning. So I want to encourage people. There's not like a great hidden committee here that's doing all this work. I really want to encourage people to stay and help us have that conversation as we try to figure out a good role going forward. And again, thanks to the panel. Hi. Um, I have a real quick question for Alice. Um, you identify yourself? I'm sorry. Um, like I said, I have a quick question for Alice. Um, but before I do that real quick, I, I have to I have to mention something over here that we already had to say. Let's put it to rest. But uh, I'm Matthew B., a uh, former sergeant in the Marine Corps, served in Iraq, and of our province in the infantry. Um, a member of Iraqi Veterans Against the War, who uh, you guys have worked with. <laughs> Nothing's off limits. Criticize everything. I was investigated for murder. If somebody wants to talk to me about it, I'll tell them exactly how it happened. You can, you can criticize it all you want right to my face. It doesn't matter. There's nothing off limits. As historians, you can't. I, I'm not. A, I'm a business major, man. You guys can't. There's nothing off limits for you guys. You guys have to identify the history. But um, that's a whole other thing. Nothing's off limits. That's how I feel. But this is totally off that subject, Alice. But it has to do with kind of an economics thing. I've been in a lot of Herman Daly lately. Um, you know, with the exploitation of the free markets, uh, the export of capital and labor and stuff like that. And you had mentioned middle class, you know, the discourse moving from working class to middle class. Is where do you see the future for the middle class in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that <laughs> 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 right. Ten seconds. Yeah. Yeah, real quick. I'm going to turn this over to David Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in, in, in 10 seconds, first of all, the notion of the middle class is itself an ideological notion that we used to be able to define it, or sociologists used to be able to define it in some ways. I don't think anybody even tries now to, de to define it. Uh, secondly, the, what we just saw about in terms of the uh, so-called bailout of the automobile workers industry and the conflict between the capacity to make that bailout and the auto workers unions efforts to maintain what they called a middle class lifestyle for working class people, which was one of the great achievements of unionism in the post-war, post-World War II period, uh, it speaks very um, sadly <laughs> for the future of the possibility of working class people becoming defined as middle class. That is what we're seeing is now, we've seen over the last 20 years an assault on working class standards of living. But what we're seeing now is an all out knockdown drag out fight. You know, when, when people begin attacking automobile workers without attacking the executives who are drawing such enormous salaries, not so much in the automobile industry, though there too, but in the banking industry, and they're complaining that auto workers are making too much, then you wonder what really is going to be left of what we now call a middle class who are basically working people making enough of a living to be able to support themselves and their families. That's probably the best definition I can come up with. So thirdly, uh, I, I think you have to fit into this picture. I know this is more than 10 seconds. The whole question of labor migration 
and how the, what we used to think of as relatively stable labor forces, uh, I mean, I know immigration occurred everywhere, but still relatively speaking, stable labor forces uh, to industrial areas from non-industrial areas, that pattern has now completely disappeared and labor migrates from place to place and from time to time, and in different configurations, that is female as well as late male labor and so on. And that also augurs badly for the maintenance of a so-called middle class standard of living. So I suppose I'd have to be fairly pessimistic about what we now call the middle class. That said, I come back to one of the comments that David made at the end of his commentaries, which is to say that that very possibility provides the occasion for the kinds of social protests that we have not seen over the last 25 years or so, that as the ideology of middle classness begins to disappear and people begin to understand that their lives may never be comfortable, that they may never be able to support their children in the way they want to support them, that the kinds of uh, efforts that we saw in the Great Depression of the 1930s, for example, to organize people, we may see again, uh, hopefully worldwide, but certainly within advanced industrial countries. So, you know, there's a bad side and a good side. <laughs> I'm thinking there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Justin, I'm a student at Columbia. Um, two questions, one uh, historical and one political. Um, uh, some of the panels were talking about precedents and continuities and discontinuities in a contemporary moment. Uh, I wonder if uh, World War I is all at all relevant in that decade. We heard about McCarthyism, we heard about the Alien Sedition Act, but from the perspective of someone growing up politically in the 90s, uh, there's an interesting uh, relationship between popular movements and political culture and war. Um, as, pe as people know, in the 1910s, there was plenty of terrorism in the United States, labor terrorism, anarchist terrorism, uh, that was repressed and, and may have provoked repression from the government. Uh, but there are also popular movements that took uh, advantage of these crises, uh, crises in American society to press their own agendas. Uh, so I'm wondering if, there's, if World War I is at all relevant to thinking about the current moment. And uh, a political question, very briefly. Um, what is the discourse that the anti-war movement might use? I mean, I've heard a lot of what we should be opposing, but I'm, I'm not sure that we've identified some kind of very basic, very basic discourse that the anti-war movement could use to appeal to a really broad base at this point. At the turn of the century, people as various as George McNeil, a labor reformer, and Samuel Gompers and Edward Atkinson, a free trade economist, were using republicanism to critique imperialism and that discourse. And it had its and Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie. Right. So it had its drawbacks in all kinds of ways, right? But at least it was a discourse that allowed for opposition. And I'm not sure we have a discourse like that, uh, other than maybe some kind of liberalism. Any panelists want to respond to that? Certainly, the uh, similarity to World War I is, is very striking, especially, I would argue, with regard to the fact that much of the uh, current regime, thank you, Barbara, for that, resuscitating that word, uh, <laughs> current regime's uh, repressive behavior has been directed against immigrants, which was certainly the case during World War I, and is in large part a reflection of the increasing presence of uh, non-native born people within the American population. But also, I think, um, simply the use of war to crack down the use of this national security rationalization <laughs> to crack down on dissent is clearly exactly the same. Just add a couple of uh, points to that, if I may. Uh, first of all, the question of looking back to World War I is certainly an important one for historians uh, to take up. Because World War I produced, among many, many other things, a huge mobilization to change the society in which that it created that war. And certainly the years 1919 to 1922, 
see the whole world seething uh, with revolt uh, against those who got them into this mess. Much of the struggle, of course, uh, seeing war veterans uh, in the vanguard uh, of those particular battles, veterans of, of every country. But secondly, in the aftermath of that, there's something that I think we do need to put our minds to today. I think we all see in some way or other the decline of the American empire going on right around us today. The power of this country over the globe, I think, is substantially less than it was 20 years uh, ago. But the decline of an empire is to be followed by what? Mm -hmm. And what we saw in the crisis of the 1920s and 30s was a sort of worldwide division of the globe into autarkic spheres in which each empire attempted to create its own internalized economy uh, with nothing to do with the others except maybe conquer them so that we could have a little more of that economy. And secondly, uh, in which immigration, as a UN survey of 1931 pointed out, immigration worldwide was virtually stopped. And this is not just a US uh, phenomenon. So the, the question then, uh, France becomes the biggest immigrant country, receiving country in the world uh, then, until uh, the 1930s. The question uh, then for us is to think both of the need to think about what kind of global international patterns uh, that we want to create uh, and are fighting in favor of uh, in, in this period, but also think of the dangers and indeed the one that was just mentioned, the danger of nativism, not just from the government, but popular nativism uh, being seen, I think, all over uh, the uh, North Atlantic world in this time. So we're, oh. uh, just to say, you know, uh, it's correct, uh, Justin, to have, uh, to need the kind of language or rhetoric to draw people in, but we also need to know how best to describe the world. Uh, the rhetoric has to come out of an accurate, as accurate, theoretically accurate description of the world. So, I mean, one of the things that I think there's a failure of is that, you know, w one fifth of the world's population lives in slums by UN calculations. Uh, in the United States, we have a working class, but we also have a disposable class. Uh, we have a class of people who are no longer needed, uh, who are to be in jail or policed in, you know, open air jails. Uh, in these neighborhoods around the country. Uh, and this disposable class is a, a considerable presence in our lives. And I think we have inaccurately uh, described the crisis in the United States. Uh, you know, there is, like as Langston Hughes wrote in The Big Sea, you know, there's a depression, but in my neighborhood there's been one for a very long time. Uh, that there are sections of the United States that have been disposed. I mean, Detroit is a case in point. Uh, it's a disposed area. You know, it's an area that is no longer necessary for the advancement of accumulation for uh, sections of the ruling class. Uh, so, I mean, we need to describe the reality better. I mean, I have often found that these slogans that we created, like support the troops, you know, that uh, this strategy doesn't work for America, things like that, these nationalistic kind of slogans, they might be useful uh, to garner short-term support, but in the long term, these are slogans that don't help, they don't emerge from, I think, an accurate description of the reality. So I think we need to have a, a debate among ourselves. You know, we fall back on liberal nationalistic slogans because we don't fully understand the political economy of the present. I'm about to call on Blanche Cook, who will be our last brief questioner. I just want to add, it's, if you didn't grow up in New York City or Chicago or some other metropole, um, you know, in, in geographic terms, the largest parts of America that have been disposed of are rural America. Everything north of Route 80 in Pennsylvania, where I grew up, is pretty much disposed of. And if you spend time in those counties, there is literally nothing there except going in the service, figuring out how to run a meth lab, or waiting for a Walmart job. And that's actually part of the political challenge. Because as someone who's not been absent from the anti-war movement, we've had nothing to say to those people at all, exactly. right? Agreed. Except we hope you come back alive and don't do something, you know, useless. Mm -hmm. So, Blanche, you've been waiting. World War I was the American Civil Liberties Union, <laughs> you know? Um, to fight repression, to fight the imprisonment of dissenters, we have the ACLU now. We have, of course, the great work of the CCR, the Center for Constitutional Rights. So what's coming out of this is, for many of us, a new vision. And for me, 
I'm very excited about an organization called NESRI, the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative. It exists to put the economic and social rights component of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on the national agenda. We've never even had a conversation about it. You know, and for those of us who were brought up by people like uh, John Cammett and Annette Rubenstein who would say, we will have socialism or we will have barbarism. Well, another word for looking at socialism is, of course, the Economic and Social Rights Initiative, which says it is a human right for health, education, housing. We have, as you said, we have 10 million homeless Americans and nobody's counting any longer. We have the school to prison pipeline, real education. So we're really looking at, and I would like us as historians against war to think of NESRI, the Economic and Social Rights Initiative, within a global reality, which is that we need, you know, Wendell Wilkie said it best in 1942, we are one world. And that came out of an epiphany that he had when he was going around the world for FDR. There was no place on earth farther by plane than the East Coast and the West Coast by train. We're all in this together. Whatever happens in one place is going to impact on everybody, everywhere, in every place. So we, as, as activist historians, really, I would like to suggest, might think about the end of this century of disgusting war and regimes and begin to think about one world under the 